Okay, this is uh, Wikipedia's article on pastoral pipes. Um, I'm just starting here because I know it's Wikipedia, but like it, it's not a bad place to start, um, especially for the basics. So, you know, at least it'll, this will give us some sort of an overview of what they are, uh, basically. Um, and then we can delve into those, like the finer points of things. And I've got at least another two much more substantial um, articles uh, t um, to go through and to read out. But I just thought that this was an okay place uh, to start. Um, even though it's, it's Wikipedia, and I know Wikipedia is open to correction, but then again, everyone's open to correction. So, um, here goes, so I'll just read it out, and I might throw in a few thoughts as, as, as I'm going along, but I just want to say from the beginning here, um, my knowledge of pastoral pipes, oh yeah, and look, sometimes the way I pronounce this word, sometimes I say it pastoral, and sometimes I say pastoral. I don't know which one is correct, and I find myself using both, putting the emphasis uh, on, sometimes I'd say pastoral for some reason, instead of just pastoral. I don't know, but anyway, don't worry about that. Um, but I just want to say that like I know very, very little about this instrument, um, other than I think I've heard, you know, that Illin pipes evolved out of them, and that they're kind of... Um, that they could, yeah, well, that they predate Illin pipes, I know that, but what I'd love to get to the bottom of in this next few articles, really, my thoughts, what I want to know, really, is were pastoral pipes played by shepherds? Like, were they actually played, like, by shepherds, by rustic, kind of peasantry, kind of poorer class of people? in a pastoral scene where they played in that scene or were they made by richer kind of more refined um people who weren't shepherds uh looking at that scene you know observing the pastoral scene so the basic question is, where do these pastoral pipes played by shepherds or not? Of Ireland and Britain, um, you know, was this a, an old thing that was kind of always continuously played by maybe peasantry or maybe even people with more money than that? Um, or, and this is what I'm suspecting now, I used to think that, I used to kind of think that, that these pastoral pipes, pastoral pipes, were the missing link kind of between, you know, you've got like, you know, Greek, you know, sort of the older archaic forms of bagpipe, like mouth blown bagpipes, like the Great Highland bagpipes and Irish war pipes from like the 1500s and 1600s and that. And then I used to think that things moved on and evolved and that the pipes became smaller. But now I'm starting to discover that smaller pipes were always played um, in Britain and Ireland, um, that they didn't necessarily evolve out of the greater, larger, bigger war pipe or like great Highland bagpipe. So like Scottish small pipes in their original form, I know, look, if you know about Scottish small pipes, you're going to tell me that they're, re that, that they're a reinvention, but they are a reinvention of older sets of pipes that were studied and looked at and yeah. but um kind of in a, in in their more like unchanged forms you've got like lowland bagpipes or what's often called border bagpipes and then in the north of england like they believe like they call i believe they call them like northumbrian half longs um and of course you've got northumbrian small pipes as well but what i'm starting to discover is that these various different kinds of smaller sets of pipes seem to have been always there um, alongside the bigger sets of pipes what we call grey highland bagpipes or war pipes so these smaller sets of pipes seem to have 
coexisted with them and not necessarily evolved out of them. But crucially, my question kind of here is, are these pastoral pipes another kind of now extinct kind of, do I say natural? I mean, they're not they're hardly unnatural, but are they part of that sort of kind of, as I say, rustic kind of tradition of pipe making? Um, are they, you know, kind of close relatives to like smaller bagpipes like Scottish small pipes or lowland bagpipes um, smaller versions perhaps of bagpipes that were played in Ireland and England um, and played by the people kind of as if, as if they were always played by the people or which is as I say what I suspect are they an actual recreation or a, a reinvented kind of a new instrument um, to reflect artistic and kind of sentimental music tastes of what's called the pastoral kind of period and setting. Um, it's a very, very important word that um, I know I seem to be waffling on a bit, but I think it's kind of crucial because when you're asking this question, like, what are they? Like, well, well let's look at the word pastoral. We need to talk a little bit about it, right? It's there was a movement. Just I'm gonna just try and summarize it because it's it's quite deep. This, but I'm just gonna try and do my best to summarize it. Uh, towards the end of the 1700s, there was this kind of artistic movement um, in kind of painting and literature and poetry and music, even. Um, initiated by the upper classes and wealthier people whereby they kind of they heavily romanticized and idealized rural settings and kind of rustic scenes and kind of like peasantry and poorer people and kind of wild countryside and this the idea then of the of the shepherds kind of came to personify all that they were trying to kind of he encapsulated all that they were sort of imagining this rural world to be um, it was a romantic idea because I think that as the wealthier people were becoming more uh, I don't know intellectual or you know the enlightenment was happening and you know, kind of critical thinking and modernizing in a way as well. Like the the wealthier people were becoming like less, um, even attuned to like nature and the seasons and countryside, and instead some of them are becoming like urbanized and suburbanized. So now, like they're living in cities and they're living in big houses or they're living in like palatial kind of manors. And they've got sort of office sort of city type of jobs. And, um, you know, they're involved in, like, world trade. Like, you know, they're involved in, like, bigger things that's going on in the world. Like, you know, the British Empire. Uh, trade, commerce, you know, all these kind of, I don't know, are they heartless kind of, soulless kind of things? Like, but... It's all about like big big business and big money and living in a fancy house and there was a real sense of loss though with them that, that that they were missing out on something and that they were becoming detached from the country, you know, from the countryside and from the simpler things in life. And in, you know, we can relate to that nowadays, you know, those of us that live in cities and towns and big suburban areas are you know sprawling kind of suburbs and you know we we still today like we can relate to that because we we miss the countryside and like who doesn't like you know escaping the city for the weekend and having a break somewhere and we always tend to go nice places like we you know we we like to go to the countryside we like to go to the mountains we like to go to seaside places and rivers and we like to get out into the great outdoors and 
it's because we're sick of city life and the hustle and bustle and hassle and fast pace and too many people about and all of that. Um, so we can relate to that and that idea of kind of turning back to nature and being organic and, you know, even down to the food we eat, you know, are you going to eat like a chicken that's like battery fed and never saw the light a day or do you want a free range chicken that was like corn fed and like l lived a happy little life on a farm yard like that's I know I'm talking about it in modern sense but I can re that's the way I relate it to what was happening in the late 1700s looking at looking at this um, pastoral movement Um, so from what I know about it anyway, they, they kind of idealised and romanticised country life because it was becoming a whole world apart than what they were used to. You know, they were used to... Just think of any kind of period lavish drama where, you know, the men are in, like, wigs with, and they're like wearing kind of that, like, lead-based, like, white makeup and the ladies have, you know, the finest big huge gowns on them and like the finest silk from places and ostrich feathers and this like lavish kind of opulence and as I say palatial mansions and they were detached from like the rural kind of countryside, the basic sort of getting back to nature kind of stuff and a lot of them lamented that so therefore they idealised the pastoral seeing, seeing and the shepherd somehow became a kind of a living symbol of somebody who's still in, you know, you know, his grip on the land, actual physical grip, even with his hands, like while he's clambering about in, in the bogs and climbing up steep rocks and that, like trying to find lost sheep, like his hands and his feet are entrenched still in the land and in nature. And he represents that rugged kind of the spirit of like man in that wild environment. But at the same time, you know, he goes back to his like little touched kind of like cozy cottage um sits by the fireside, you know, his wife and children and, you know, they're kind of self sufficient and they're farming and are sort of living off the land and, and you see this was the romantic kind of image that the richer people had of a lot of these poorer people and peasants and that and you know lots of these kind of scenes that they painted both in, in actual paintings and in, in poetry and, and verse and words and that paint this idyllic kind of almost lazy almost sort of kind of a life of sort of leisure and you know there's lads kind of like lying around on like warm rocks like next to the river like with you know just maybe cooling their feet in the stream or somebody else is lazing under a tree under a tree and then someone else is like lazing around on the side of a hill sitting there playing his like pipes to his sheep or his cattle and, or goats or whatever and so they started, the rich people, for all their hustle and bustle and and kind of wealth and luxuries that they had, and, you know, they weren't, you know, hungry and did all sorts of luxuries and conveniences or whatever, they kind of lamented and envied in a strange way the poor people um, because they appeared to live this kind of carefree, sort of free-spirited um romantic, lazy, leisurely, um, yeah, tough, but sort of lifestyle. And these rich people kind of wanted to kind of get back in touch with that in some sort of a strange way. It's, it's, it's a weird one. It's a paradox, but then I, I love paradox. Um, so anyway, so in this pastoral movement, um, they idealised and romanticised these pastoral scenes. And my guess, though, is that they may have refined, I was going to say reinvented or invented a bagpipe that suited the music. 
See, don't forget as well, they were listening as well. This, this is quite important too. The, the music that they were listening to was European kind of, you know, where the like late Baroque period starts to meet, meet the kind of classic period. We're moving from Baroque into kind of classical music. And it's, you know, it's quite international. It, it's European, it's German, it's Italian, it's Dutch, you know, it's, the, you know, it's Russian and um, French and... I think that part of the part of the people um, wanted to hear something more native. They wanted to hear something native from both these islands, like you know the rich wealth of folk music that could be tapped into in England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, you know, it's such a rich, vast bank of tunes and music um, that these cultured kind of classic people wanted to access and tap into and maybe take it from that rustic kind of uncouth wild a little bit kind of you know beyond the the pale kind of folk traditional music to kind of bring it closer to a more i don't know agreeable or acceptable are a little bit more civilized type of setting like um you know an opera house or you know a grand room in a big house where you have a little ensemble of musicians and singers but they want to kind of keep it a little bit native you know like keep it a bit traditional so you know let's play beautiful folk songs which there are some beautiful melodies and beautiful folk songs but like let's play it on one of our own instruments and i have a feeling that the existing sets of bagpipes that were played were a bit too rough around the edges maybe a bit too uncouth and a bit you know they weren't as i said in another discussion about music being standardized these instruments quite often just weren't standardized and um, they were quite unique they played in kind of different scales um they may you know they they play like they didn't know you know they, they played in their own kind of scales um that may not have been compatible with other easily compatible anyway with other instruments and even the even the scales that they were using like i said this before like this idea of do re mi fa so la ti do that's just one scale and it's that has become kind of our standard that we're all used to listening to now but there were different kinds of scales more archaic scales like there was like the diatonic scale there's a chromatic scale there's a pentatonic scale there's all sorts of scales and there's still, these scales are still there but that do re mi that we're used to kind of became the standard so we tend to judge music off that but in previous times that wasn't necessarily the scale like so there was differences like those kind of half notes and yeah you know semitones and um i don't know the technical names for these things but to our ear a lot of them would sound like boom notes they'd sound strange or a bit weird to air there but in their own time they weren't weird they that was just part of their repertoire of scale and that sort of suited the songs that they were singing as well that's why when we listen to older music like kind of more renaissance music or like kind of henry the eighth sort of music it sounds a bit weird like there's some sort of notes um some notes that sort of sound odd in in this thing that that mark them out as being more ar archaic and old um like let me think of one like yeah like there's a lovely one called i'll give you an example called the coventry carol right um and it goes like Luli Lula the little tiny child Bye bye Luli Lule the little tiny child Bye bye Luli Lula So here the way I sang that like child it sounded odd the little tiny child it's it's 
it's it's uh, I, I don't it's hard for me to explain it but it's odd but that would have suited the scale at the time that wouldn't have sounded so odd at the time now it sounds nice and all of that but like there's other ones that sound even weirder than that like that's just an example of one or two kind of odd notes so it might sound odd to air there and that give it that kind of old-fashioned sort of archaic sound but anyway getting back to the pipes I have a suspicion that the pipes that were being played, smaller pipes that were being played, that could be played indoors, might have been still operating on these older scales. Um, and even like the keys that they were in as well might have been odd or peculiar kind of keys that wouldn't have readily matched other instruments. So, I have a feeling that this was an attempt, these pastoral pipes, or pastoral pipes, I think was was, was, was an, a, an attempt to kind of maybe refine a bit, or maybe standardise, standardise maybe a bit more um, an instrument, looking at existing sets of pipes, because like looking at them, they look an awful lot like, they look an awful lot like lowland pipes, like our if you want to call them Scottish border pipes or if you want to call them Northumbrian half longs or North Northumbrian big pipes or whatever, they look quite similar to those kinds of pipes. Um, and then they also look quite similar to early Illum pipes, but that's because I believe Illum pipes evolved out of these. So anyway, I've just gone by all, what, all but what, what I've just said there. My overall impression is that this is a sort of a, a recreation or a refinement of existing instruments to standardize them and um, to make them play in acceptable um, keys in acceptable scales at an acceptable volume that they could be more um, compatible and comparable with other instruments being played at the time like I believe like oboes had a bigger had a big influence on this like don't forget an oboe is essentially a chanter that you just put straight into your mouth with the reed you put the reed straight into your mouth and you blow down on it now now some of them that family of instruments that have developed cap covers and mouth pieces and some of them ended up being single reeds and some of them ended up being in double reeds but essentially like you had got older instruments like the sham s-h-a-u-m and that essentially was a chanter that you just put straight into your mouth you put the reed and all in your mouth and you blow it so i believe but those instruments became standardized with baroque music and with classical music whereas i feel that many of the bagpipes that we are playing although they're from the same families they were left out on the outskirts out on the out on the perimeters of this kind of standardized kind of Baroque com coming into classical world. This is where kind of folk music, I think, kind of diverged a bit and stayed out of that kind of, you know, compass of standard classical, what's turning into classical music. Um, folk music, I think, stayed on the, out on the periphery of that. And I think that this these pastoral pipes were an attempt by these people who were familiar with the finer things in life finer music everything was finer with them you know their food was finer their clothes were finer their maybe their musical tastes and their musical experience even was finer than the more rustic people who didn't may not have kind of traveled like to you know seeing great courts or great orchestras or you know of their day or music ensembles or you know they, they may have led a more sort of a basic life um, and I have a feeling anyway that more wealthier people anyway were essentially trying to refine a folky cultural bagpipe to fit in with their norms and their standards and make it acceptable but the, the, to keep the connection of the traditional English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh folk tunes and to play them now on a more standard acceptable instrument and that they could be adapted then as well, maybe to play French tunes and other kind of fashionable tunes that were being played. So that's my overall kind of forethought on on past pastoral pipes. Um, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. So this is my ideas though, but um, let's just see. So 
let's just start um, with this uh, Wikipedia. Uh, this is all a le learning curve for me. So we'll start off at the basics here. So here's the Wikipedia article anyway, and sure we'll, 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 we'll run with this for the time being. And then I will get into more elaborate and deeper um, articles. I've got two uh, ready um, for the next two episodes. So anyway, here goes. Um, pastoral pipes. The pastoral pipe, also known as the Scottish pastoral pipes, hybrid union pipes, organ pipe and union pipe, was a bellows blown bagpipe widely recognised as the forerunner and ancestor of the 19th century Union Pipes, which became the Illin Pipes of today. Similar in design and construction, it had a foot joint in order to play the low leading note and plays a two octave chromatic scale. So there's the scale, it's chromatic. There is a, tu there is a tutor for the pastoral or new bagpipe by J. Gagan, published in London in 1745. It had been considered that Gagan had overstated the capabilities of the instrument, but a study on surviving instruments has shown that it that it did indeed did ha, have a range of chromatic possibilities, which he claimed. History: This bagpipe was commonly played in the lowlands of Scotland, the Borders, and Ireland from the mid 18th until the early 20th century. It was a precursor of what are now known as Illin pipes, and there were several well-known makers over a large geographic area, including London, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dublin, and Newcastle upon Tyne. Therefore, it is difficult to say which country the pastoral pipe and its later adapted union pipe specifically come from, although the earliest known piping tune book, Gagan's Complete Tutor, refers to a maker in London in 1746. But I just want to add in there that your man Gagan himself was Irish. Right, so he's talking about a London maker of the instrument, but he's Irish. Anyway, I think that it was a shared kind of development, like where they borrowed ideas from like Scottish, English and Irish pipe makers and musicians, I think kind of collectively worked on this over time or it developed through sharing ideas over and back. I don't think anyone can claim ownership of it. Well, the two islands, like what the hell? Like just, we, we all own it, like that's the way I look at it. Anyway, as the pastoral pipe was modified, it developed into the union pipe in the period 1770 to 1830. Makers in all three countries contributed ideas and design improvements, yeah. Both pipes were played by gentlemen pipers of the period in Scotland, England, and the Anglo-Irish Protestants of Ireland, people in society who could afford an expensive handmade set of pipes. Yeah, now that's what I'm getting at. That's that's what I find is interesting that you know they were they were played by gentlemen of these countries, people who could afford an expensive handmade set of pipes. So from the outset there, this article seems to be saying that they're not a peasant instrument. But what I actually think happened with them, eventually, now this is just me talking right off the bat, I think that maybe as these pastoral pipes and later on union or illin pipes fell out of fashion with the gentry, right, this might have been the fashion from the late 1700s to the early 1800s, but it's my opinion that if when these instruments started to fall out of fashion with those classes, maybe they fell into the hands then of the lower classes who started to play them. Like they got their hands on these brilliant, amazingly well-made sets of pipes and started playing them. That's my impression. Um, but, and now we associate, you see, usually when you associate these kinds of instruments, like well i don't know in ireland anyway we tend to associate them with the peasantry and the famine and not so much gentlemen but i i, I these were began were begun by gentlemen maybe is not a weird sort of a circle that you have maybe they were inspired inspired by the rustic peasantry and the basic kind of bagpipes that they had and then the people the gentlemen and people with money refined that and made a kind of a cleaner more advanced instrument 
And then when that fell out of decline with that, with that class of people, then those same instruments ended up back in the hands of the very peasants or people who inspired the whole thing in the first place. This, <laughs> this, is, this is my idea of a butcher. Look, I'll read on anyway, sorry. The term new bagpipe refers to the expanded compass and improvements to the instrument. Although the term pastoral is not historically found outside Gagan's London context, it is evocative of a style of music played at the time. See, the style of music was called pastoral music, which means it was based in folk. That's what that means. Folky music played by kind of peasants and shepherds and stuff like that. Originally, the label pastoral may refer to the ancient pastoral airs played on the instrument, composed in a gentle, very sweet, easy manner in the immolation of those airs which shepherds are supposed to play. Okay. This style would suit the sweet tone of the pastoral pipes, union slash illin pipes of the late 18th century, when literature, art and music romanticised rural life. There you go. In the 19th century, oboes were being marketed in London as pastoral to fit the music styles of the times. The pastoral bagpipe may have been the invention of an expert instrument maker who was aiming at the romantic market. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought. The pastoral pipes and later union pipes were certainly a favourite of the upper classes in Scotland. Ireland and the northeast of England and were fashionable for a time in formal social settings where the term union pipes may originate. The first reference to a pastoral pipe comes from popular and fashionable pastoral dramas of the time with music such as The Gentle Shepherd of 1725 by the writer and poet Alan Ramsey and the, and the English ballad the Beggar's Opera in 1728 as a countermeasure against the influx of pastoral Italian music. The opera featured an en masse dance led by a pastoral pipe and the scene was engraved by William Hogwarts who lived from 1697 to 1764 who clearly shows a bellows blown bagpipe similar to the one later depicted in The Gagan Tutor. The Gagan repertoire draws on contemporary compositions, namely the London organist John Ravenwood, 1745, composer John Gray, 1745. The musical collection of William Thompson's Orpheus Caledonius in 1733, as well as operatic arrangements for the Ussian cycle. The pastoral pipes were regarded in a classical or neo-baroque setting, played by gentlemen pipers and spread across the upper circles of polite society as the instrument of choice. I think that says it all, that line there. The pastoral pipes were regarded in a classical or neo-baroque setting, played by gentlemen pipers and spread across the upper circles of polite society as the instrument of choice. So that's what I think. I think they took their inspiration from the rustic and the more basic kind of forms of bag, similar types of bagpipes and they refined them. Anyway, an established bellows pipes with an extended range is noted to be played across Scotland no later than 1760 in the complete theory of the great Highland bagpipe by Joseph MacDonald. Lovers of Ussian felt a kind of enthusiastic rapture when they beheld the guests seated and the bards, the bards arranged in the flower-decked halls of Fingal when they heard the sweet harmony of the harps, the clarshock, and the union pipes, and the song of the bards, they heard also the warlike sound of the shields of the Hall of Fingal. The first reference to the instrument in Ireland is provided by John O'Keefe in 1760 as an instrument of polite society. 
and the emerging and the emerging pastoral and prototype union pipe influenced the folk tradition of the 18th and 19th century in Scotland and Ireland. This can be thought of as a shared as a shared tradition which served which served a neo-baroque orchestral and concert fashion but also drew strongly on the native traditions of both Scotland and Ireland and the music styles of the times. The pastoral pipes can be played either standing or yeah, that, that's important because I think that's what, what I was sort of taught in the first place. As I say, this is all a, a learning curve for me too. So the way it says, um, uh, this emerging uh, pastoral and prototype union pipe influenced the folk tradition of the 18th and 19th century Scotland and Ireland. It can be taught of as a shared tradition which served neo-baroque orchestral and concert fashion, but also drew strongly on the native traditions of both Scotland and Ireland as the music styles of the times. So it drew strongly on native traditions, which which I, which is where I think it came out of in the first place. Then it becomes refined and kind of quality and, you know, upper circles of, of polite society uh, instrument of choice and then it gets to be played in an orchestral and a concert fashion but then it itself ends up turning around and influencing the folk tradition of the late 18th and 19th century so yeah it's i kind of see it as part of the of the cycle i, I see it as a refined kind of an bagpipe as coming as part of the cycle anyway we'll get on with the article um, the pastoral pipes can be played either standing or in a seated position using a set of bellows and the chanter is similar to the later union pipes but it had an added foot joint that extended its range of one tone lower. This added foot joint had holes in its sides in addition to the hole at the bottom of the bar. The pastoral pipes are like the highland bagpipes and that the sound is continuous. Notes are articulated by finger technique, techniques such as grace notes. The union pipes, which evolved from the pastoral pipes, enabled the player to interrupt the flow of air by stopping the end of the chanter on his knee. This doesn't work for the pastoral instrument because of the side holes. Many later pastoral sets, though, have a dismountable foot joint. When this is removed, they can play, be played as union pipes. The surviving instruments indicate that the pastoral pipes had two or three drones and generally one regulator. So there, that's a fascinating thing there that I'm only just after discovering really recently. This 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 um, detachable foot joint. Um, it says if you that you could take this foot joint off it was dismountable when this was removed they, the pipes can be played as union pipes um which meant then that you could stop the chanter on your knee or on your lap like you, what you would see like with modern day illum pipes and the popping strap but if you ever look at the bottom of the chanter on a modern day illum pipe it still has that shape that tenon as though something can be fitted over it I, that never crossed my mind before because most most pipes that you look at like from anywhere have this kind of a bell end uh, at the end of the chanter like it's a, a bell end or a kind of a disc type of thing or, um, whereas the union pipe in my opinion I remember lo looking at my own Ireland pipes years ago and asking a piper that question why has it got that little bit on the end like it, it looks good like it looks unfinished because you even have a feral above it um like the meeting of a joint and there's your answer there it's because it came from the pastoral pipe when they would screw off this foot joint and then you would have been left with the with the tenon you know um i think i'm think i think that's the proper term isn't it mortise and tenon the bit that sort of shoves into the other bit so that's that little bit on the end of the ellen pipe chanter it comes from straight out of this this time it's a it's a hangover from the past. Um, okay, yeah, so surviving instruments, they say that the pastoral pipes had two or three drones and generally uh, 
one um, regulator. Um, just here's another little bit about that foot joint. It says removal of the foot joint. The pastoral pipes gradually evolved into the union pipes as Baroque musical tastes favoured a more expressive type of instrument. The foot joint may have fallen out of use as early as 1746 to the 1770s, as oboists of the period who usually played pastoral pipes would frequently remove or invert the foot joint in order to remove the low C foot joint to play the chanter upon the knee. The fall from grace of the open chanter was slow to take effect as pastoral pipes with removable foot joints were still being made in the 1850s and played up until the First World War. In time the instrument would be tuned for performance on the knee rather than off it and the foot joint remnant today is the tenon cut around the foot of the modern Illin chanter. Yeah, there you go. Um, right, tuning. The conventional view was that the pastoral pipes were difficult to shift between the lower and upper registers. Recent reconstructions and refurbishments have shown that this is not the case. In modern illin pipes, the player will move from the lower to the upper register or octave um, by stopping the chanter momentarily while increasing the bag pressure, causing the reed to double tone. However, in the pastoral pipe, the same effect can be achieved by increasing the bag pressure while playing a suitable grace note. For example, to go from the first octave A into the second octave A, the player can use the E grace note. Um, and listen, I say octave, I know loads of you are out, out there saying octave. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm right, but I've always grown up saying octave instead of octave, so I'm going to stick with that. Anyway, surviving pastoral pipe manuscripts have many tunes that leap vigorously between registers. So that means that if they could leap vigorously between registers, that mean, meant that it wasn't all that difficult to go from the lower octave into the higher octave. As they say there, just do a grace note. Like if you go, it says... To go from the first octave A to second octave A, the player can use an E grace note. So the ability to stop the chanter does help though. It also gives the instrument much better dynamics as the chanter can be raised and lowered from the knee to modulate the volume. This may have motivated the evolution into the union pipe by removing the foot joint from the pastoral pipes. And that's, that's actually something that I've tried um, myself playing the Scottish small pipes. Um, I've just tried it just to see how it sounds. Um, I've put the chanter on my knee um, to see, and it does actually make a bit of a difference in the sound. Um, it seems to sound louder in volume, but then again, that's, I'm just wondering, is that because it's closer to me? Um, and it... Yeah, it has an effect. It, it's it 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 kind of I, I don't know how to describe it, whether it dulls the sound or it brightens the sound or it certainly makes it sound a bit different. Um I don't know does it sharpen it or flatten it overall. It's just something worth experimenting. It, like with if you, because most of us just when we play Scottish small pipes, you tend to either have the chanter between your two legs, like if you're sitting down, you'd have it between your two legs, or else over on, on the side, down the side of one leg, like if you're a right-handed player, you might, ha like, as you're looking down, you're looking at your right leg, the chanter would be on the right-hand side, like, the right-hand side of your leg. Um, I start, excuse me, if the hiccups, I started doing that because I often wear the kilt, and when I wear the kilt, the kilt stops me from putting it between my two legs. It makes it... I have to hold the chanter up too high for myself when I'm sitting down. Um, this is playing Scottish small pipes now. Um, so then I started putting my chanter over to the right of my leg. Um, but when I'm wear, when I'm not wearing a kilt, uh, I've 
started to put the chanter on my leg to see the difference that gives in sound. Yeah, so, I mean, they were experimenting with that 200 years ago, so like you could, it, it, it's worth trying if you're, if you, if you're playing um, Scottish small pipes. I don't know how, how border pipes would figure out with that one. Um, and obviously if you're standing, you can't do it. Anyway, um, the chanter. The pastoral chanter is used to play the melody and is similar to later flat sets of union pipes in tone. It has eight finger holes, giving the middle C, D, E flat, E, F sharp, A, B, C sharp, high D, using open fingering in the first register. Most of the accidentals can be obtained by cross fingering and a second register is available by increasing the bag pressure. With a suitable read, the first, sorry, the few third octave notes can also be played. Later sets included fully chromatic chanters using as many as seven keys. The chanter uses a complex double bladed read similar to that of the oboe or bassoon. This must be crafted so that it can play two full octaves accurately without the without the fine tuning allowed by the use of the, a player's lips. Only bag pressure and fingering can be used to maintain the correct pitch of e each note. And a little last bit here about instrument makers of the pastoral and union pipes. Some of the oldest surviving instruments date from the 1770s to the 1790s. Notably, James Kennett of Mullingar, Hugh Robertson of Edinburgh, and later Robert Reed of North Shields. Pipe makers started to optimise the instrument for performance on the knee rather than off it, so that players could take advantage of the better dynamics this offered. It is possible that the performer, that the performer community diverged for a while into union pipers playing without the foot joint and all style pastoral pipers who retained it and could play in both styles. In any case, both long and short pastoral slash union chanters were documented in both Scotland and Ireland until around World War I. The evolution of the union and illin, a term originate, originating in 1904 by Irish nationalists uh, pipes, was also yeah, that's it. for anyone that doesn't know that it's because they reckon that for Irish nationalists, kind of as in Republican nationalists, they didn't like the term union being used to describe the pipes because it reminded them of the act of union, or as if it had some, as if it, the, these pipes had something to do with the act of union or the union basically of the two islands. Um. Uh, and that's not what it meant at all, because the term union pipes actually predates the act of union. So, but for nationalists and kind of Republican kind of nationalists, they didn't like the term union because just of its connotations with unionism and um, everything else. So they changed it then from union to illin. Now, there was a whole big art. I read out another article um another video about the evolution of illin pipes so where the term illin came from um illin just me it just means the irish warfare elbow so elbow pipes and then um there's discussions about how long that's in use like how long were they being called illin pipes like shakespeare calling them wo woolen pipes and it's a whole interesting thing but i've, I've dealt with all of that in my um articles on illin pipes Anyway, where are we? Yeah, so the evolution of the Union and Illin pipes was also driven by competition uh, between makes. Throughout the late 18th and early 19th century, pipe makers in Aberdeen, Dublin, Edinburgh and Newcastle competed and copied each other's ideas and innovations. Yeah, that makes sense. It is now taught that the existence of of regulators, already a common feature of the pastoral pipes, 
a characteristic keyed stop end and ended system was the inspiration for the Cade Northumbrian small pipes, probably first produced by John Dunn, who made both pastoral and Northumbrian pipes in Newcastle upon Tyne. Instrument variations. Historic, historical examples of various designs have turned up over a wide geographical area, and several pipe makers have offered reconstructions. They are not widely played, though research and interest in them is currently increasing. Well, that's it. Um, yeah, I thought that was a fairly um, clearly written article. Um, lots in it, like lots of food for thought. Um, it's kind of the way I kind of thought it might be. Um, I'm not saying that I'm right all the time about everything, but as I say, I'm still learning about it. Um, as I say, in the beginning, I had kind of thought that pastoral pipes like were just solely the, the, the preserve of kind of, as I say, like the rustics and kind of peasants and that. But I, I've since learned that I think it they're more if it, a feature of, of a refined type of instrument and a refined class and whatever else. Uh, so that's a good, I think, I think that's a good overall impression of what pastoral pipes are. Um, and it says there, you know, um, research and interest in them is currently increasing, which it is, I'm glad to say. Um, I'd love to think that, like, I'm interested in, in, in acquiring a set of pastoral pipes at the moment. I'm coming, I'm kind of nearly there. I'm nearly there with that. I, I don't have them just yet. I'm kind of working on it and have a few ideas. But, I'd like to see them as, a, you know, that bridge gap to, if you've heard any of my articles uh, before, like me talking about me playing pipes, uh, I started off on illin pipes and I just found them extremely difficult. Um, I gave up on them. I just, I, uh, they broke my heart. But I've always kind of been meaning to get back to that, that sound. Um, at the moment, like I'm, I'm currently playing Scottish small pipes with border pipe drones, um, which I really like. Don't get me wrong, I love them. Um, they're kind of, I've been I had been playing like the Grey Highland bagpipes for many years. I, I took them straight up after I kind of failed on Illin pipes, and I took on I got on better with the bigger bagpipes, um, but I was always missing that soft sweet beautiful mellow sound of an illin pipe and to me at the moment the closer the, the closest that I've been able to manage to handle is a Scottish small pipe um but I'm kind of wondering and I'm thinking out loud could these pastoral pipes be maybe even my link back back to an illin pipe you know are they the bridge of a gap um Say for argument's sake, for you know, or you know, maybe the I just I, and, and I'm sorry to say this, like like I really am, like and I completely admire Ellen Pipers because they've mastered it or whatever. But I just found, I just found the Ellen Pipe kind of chanter and everything about the instrument very unforgiving, unfortunately. Um, I didn't just find I just didn't find them easy to play at all. Like I found them very temperamental and very, as I say, unforgiving. Like hard on the player. Like like mistakes are like, like really easily and loudly heard. And you know they sound you know like a major fail. Kind of when you're making you're playing something and you make a mistake. It's I well, maybe just that's just me being overly conscientious or something, but I I found the Ellen pipes as I say just a bit a bit severe and kind of strict and unforgiving and um kind of too temperamental. Like I always thought there was something wrong with them. Like I always thought either the reed was too soft or it was too hard or everything seemed to affect them. Like the weather, like you know what if it's a nice sunny day they may go grey for you. If it's pissing rain tomorrow they'll sound shit or else vice versa um, and you're forever messing around with reeds and I just 
with, with me, the Ellen Pipes, as much as I loved the sound of them, the just the hassle of them was just was too much for me to take. And so I gave up after about seven years. And as I say, I find Scottish small pipes much more forgiving. Um, they're much more balanced. They're far less temperamental. They're far less hassle. And they're much easier to play, um, in my opinion, anyway. And But at the same time, as I always say, I miss that sound. I miss being able to do that sound. So I'm kind of thinking out loud, I wonder, would a pastoral pipe maybe a bit more forgiving than an Ellen pipe if it's just that little bit more basic like even that low d like like why would you have to lift up your two like to go from d to e right um now as you probably know by now listen to me i can't read music so i can sometimes get the basic abcs with my fingers like i now have my fingers on a pen so as i'm working out the notes like i can't just if you shout it, shout it to me Play a C, play a G, play an E. I wouldn't be able to do it straight away. I have to go like counting on my fingers to see which one is which and all that. But just, just I know, like say the scales of an Ellen pipe, like D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D. Okay, but like I always wondered, like when you're going from D to E, what, why do you, why do you need both your little finger and the the, the second finger? Like why did the the little finger have to be part of that? Do you know that way? Um. Whereas when you play a Grey Highland bagpipe or a Scottish smite pipe or even a tin whistle, you just, you know, you have your top three fingers and your and your lower three fingers and then you have a thumb hole. So, um, as far as I can see, the um, pastoral pipe players that I've been watching also have that same arrangement. Um, top three fingers, bottom three fingers. And in fact, your little finger gets you the... Um, gets you a low C if you use your little finger you, you get the low C under the D um, but yeah look anyway that's look I, I won't know till I eventually get a set and try them out but I'm hoping that they're more playable I think easier on me anyway than Ellen Pipes have been uh, I'd love to know your thoughts if you're listening to this if you're familiar with pastoral pipes Ellen Pipes Scottish small pipes Border pipes I've tried as well, and I've heard that said about border pipes as well, that they're less forgiving than Scottish small pipes as well. Maybe it's the harsher sound and it's the the stronger reed and whatever that make them a bit maybe harder to blow or the reed might be a bit more temperamental. Um, yeah, so I've heard that said about lowland pipes or border pipes that they're a bit more unforgiving than Scottish small pipes as well. So... Yeah, please look at if you enjoyed if you enjoyed listening to this, um please leave your comments below. I'm here to learn as well. I always keep saying I'm no expert on things. I I I speak my mind about stuff that I kinda think I know about or half know about at least and I love reading these articles and, and learning new stuff and reading your comments um helps helps us all to learn. Uh we all should be able to throw our opinions out there. Um just please don't get into shitty arguments. That's all I'm going to ask. Just when you're writing comments, stop. Don't be taking the piss out of people or just insulting people. Just please keep it kind of informative and helpful and whatever else. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get back into this, a few more articles about these pastoral pipes again soon, um, a little bit deeper. I think this was a broad sort of overview of them. Um, but I think there's a, there's a bit more meat left on, on those bones that I want to... Uh, sink my teeth into a bit and uh, yeah get stuck into them so um, yeah I hope you enjoyed it I hope you learned a bit I certainly did and sure um, I hope you uh, like the next video uh, about piping thanks for listening and sure I'll talk to you again